All right, excellent. Welcome everyone to a, another educational webinar that is through EBFA and in partnership with Naboso. My name is Dr. Swickle. I am the founder of EBFA and Naboso and a functional podiatrist, global educator, very passionate about barefoot science, and I truly love toe spacers. So I hope you do as well. I'd mentioned it before we got started that in the spirit of this, make sure you have those toe spacers out and on. If you do not have Naboso Splay and you're wearing one of the other great brands that are out there, no judgment as long as you are still doing your spreading and splaying. So for tonight's webinar, we are going to be looking at the science of toe spacers, why having balance to our forefoot is so important, and really giving you some of that science and why. Because I think a lot of people may be thinking about toe spacers as just for hammer toes and bunions. I'm going to go into how they are beneficial for more so than just hammer toes and bunions. I, of course, will share the information behind hammer toes and bunions, but I'm going to go into a few other conditions as well that it will be beneficial. And if some people say there is no science behind spacers, this can help you explain to them the benefits. I do have a few research studies on there to give that justification to those individuals who may be a little bit concerned or hesitant. Uh, so we will be diving into that. Now, if for any reason you get disconnected or you want to listen to the recording after, you will get that recording. It will be sent to everybody uh, so that you can reference back on this. Uh, and I have a special offer at the end that I will make sure everyone is aware of. So here we go. Okay, already briefly introduced myself, podiatrist. Uh, CEO of Noboso, author, all that fabulous stuff. If you want to follow me on Instagram, make sure you do uh, at DPM. Put little two underscores after that, just because I was recently hacked. So had to go in and change a few things. So DPM. put two little underscores after that. You will follow me. For Noboso is Noboso underscore technology. Put a lot of content and education out there. Uh, and I'll make sure at the end I share Share with you also ebfa's information which is ebfaglobal.com all right so our goal when we are thinking about toe spacers what i want you to be thinking about initially the initial part is that we are balancing what is happening at the forefoot and when it comes to the forefoot your digits your digits play a very important role in how we maintain balance so having strong digits strong toe flexor strength is important to maintaining static and dynamic balance it is also very important to how we maintain what's called toe purchase so you want to make sure that your digits are actually contacting the ground now as we start to lose toe flexor strength or as we lose purchase because of hammering of digits, uh, a loss of muscular strength, certain neurological conditions, you get spasticity and then the digits start to lift up. That is going to have a correlation to decreased stability and therefore, of course, a fall risk. On the other side, you can actually see it with athletes. And for athletes, we want to be having optimal digit purchase and flexor strength to optimize acceleration and vertical jump. So kind of put it to those two extremes that whether we are trying to control from a neurological perspective, we want to have good balanced forefoot in high optimizing athletic performance and athletes, we need to have a balanced forefoot as well obviously everyone in between as well. Okay, so these are gonna be the four main conditions just initially that we're going to go into of what you can think about. Okay, who is appropriate for benefiting from toe spacers, right? It's going to be the obvious bunions, hammer toes, right? Something with the digits. We can extend it down into neuromas. Someone who's suffering from a neuromas, getting them to open up that forefoot, really important. And then of course that plantar fasciitis, I start speaking about this more on social media of how toe spacers can help with plantar fasciitis. We'll go into that anatomy and then why it is beneficial to them. 
After we go into some of those conditions, I'm going to go into why toast spacers are beneficial for everyone as far as a form of recovery and for really undoing the stress that a lot of common footwear does to individuals. So let's get started with our bunions. So your bunions, really what you're thinking about when someone has a bunion, hallux valgus here, you see this angulation of the digit, right? Why would we use toe spacers to pull that digit back in alignment? Well, what happens when the hallux shifts over or abducts away from our midline is that we start to destabilize the forefoot. And that loss of stability is going to translate up the entire kinetic chain towards our glutes. So there are some research studies showing this correlation between a loss of first MPJ function and glute strength. So this uh, big toe butt connection that Dr. Perry of Stop Chasing Pain always speaks about, or just first MPJ glute max contraction, hip extension during the propulsive phase of gait, we need to have a centered aligned first MPJ. Okay. So that's called centration. So when you say someone with a bunion uses toe spacers, you're using it to re-center the first MPJ. Now, when you center a joint, or in this case, the first MPJ, we start to align cartilage with cartilage. Now, when you are protecting joint health and minimizing the risk of arthritis, you want to have good cartilage over cartilage alignment. As, start as, as soon as you start to lose centration and you deviate off of that cartilage alignment, you are now starting to degenerate that joint and increasing the risk of arthritis. Osteoarthritis is what you're decreasing, right? So degenerative joint disease, very common with bunions because you lose centration and you deviate off of the cartilage. You can minimize the arthritis progression in a bunion through the use of toe spacers because you are realigning and recentering the joint. Now, does that mean in someone with a bunion, if you take off the toe spacers, the toe is going to stay straight? No. So this is going to be used on the foot every day and why someone with a bunion that I would recommend using it all day in your shoes because we need something to mechanically put that joint back into a centered position to protect your cartilage. Okay. Now what also happens, I'm going to go to the next slide when I talk about your sesamoids. So over here, Right here, this is going to be the x-ray of someone with a bunion. Now, this would actually be considered a moderate to severe bunion. So moderate to severe bunion, we can see exactly what that would look like. Here's clinically, here's radiographically. Okay, now I'm looking at this. Do you see how the toe is deviated over? I have come off of cartilage, and then the other cartilage surface is over here is completely misaligned, right? That's the arthritis risk that I was talking about. Now under, you can see this bone, this is your sesamoids, okay? Now your sesamoids, sesamoid bones, which are supposed to sit under your first met head, they get pulled over by the anatomy. I'll show you on another slide shortly, it gets pulled over by that anatomy. And when it pulls the intrinsic muscles over, it destabilizes the forefoot. So do you start to see that a lot of these things are correlated with each other? Bunion, sesamoids deviate, loss of stabilization in the foot because of the intrinsic shifting over, you lost centration of the cartilage, increased arthritis risk, okay? So this is the muscle that I'm talking about. So right here, this is your flexor hallucis brevis, flexor hallucis brevis. And within the tendons of your flexor hallucis brevis are your sesamoid bones, okay? Now, when someone gets a bunion, the adductor hallucis right here starts to pull over. And because it's blending into the tendon of your flexor hallucis brevis and your sesamoids, it's pulling your sesamoids with it, okay? So tight adductor hallucis 
pulling sesamoids laterally so that that patient's x-ray starts to look like this. Okay. Now, what also comes with those sesamoids is one of the most important intrinsic muscles in the foot, your AB ductor hallucis. And anyone who is just well informed on foot anatomy knows that your AB ductor hallucis is your short foot muscle. So when we do short foot exercise, a lot of that research is really focused on how much it activates AB ductor hallucis. Abductor hallucis is a muscle that actually lifts your arch. So we need to have a strong abductor hallucis to have a strong arch in the foot. But if someone has a bunion and the adductor is pulling those sesamoids to the side, it's pulling the abductor with it, and then now it's going to be a weaker muscle, which means now it cannot lift the arch as effectively. So using toe spacers and trying to pull that toe over and relax the adductor is trying to get just a little bit more strength to the abductor hallucis. Okay. Now, this is why when someone who has a bunion tries to do short foot, they're going to have a hard time engaging that exercise or that contraction because the toe is deviated over and the sesamoids pulled with it. If you do short foot on someone with a bunion and they use the toe spacers, you are essentially trying to help the abductor hallucis contract. Okay, hopefully that makes sense. So can toe spacers correct or cure reverse my bunion? The answer to that is a big old, it depends, <laughs> okay? Now, what it depends on is the severity of the bunion, right? So this is where we want to make sure that we're very transparent with our clients, with ourselves, me, with my patients, when I say, okay, why am I recommending the toe spacers to someone with a bunion? Am I doing it to reverse it? Am I doing it as a stretch and a reset? Or am I telling them this is going to cure your bunion and their bunion looks over here all the way on the severe end? No, 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 it can't do that. That is, as you start to get moderate, large, severe, you are looking at surgical correction for these bunions. But does that mean if the toe spacers aren't going to cure it or reverse it, that someone with a moderate, large, or severe bunion should not use these? No, absolutely not. Because even though the goal may not be to cure the bunion or reverse it, I'm trying to keep them as functional as I can when they are taking their 5,000 steps a day. So yes, with a moderate or large bunion, I still want you using toe spacers because I want to try to help your intrinsics. I want to try to support joint centration as much as I can. And then if you decide to have surgery, awesome. I'm going to help you get a more functional foot. If you do not want to have surgery, no problem. We'll try to keep you as functional as possible and then understand where toe spacers can play a role in your foot and with that bunion. Okay, so from bigger picture, bunions with toe spacers is this is where you want to be thinking about it in your shoes during the day when you're walking around. The reason is that we got to keep that joint aligned as much as possible so we can protect the cartilage and minimize the risk or the progression of arthritis. Okay, as much of the day as possible. Yes, yes, yes. As a form of recovery, if you happen to have a bunion and wear shoes that don't fit a toe spacer, understand, but can we make sure every night when we get out of our shoes that we're putting on our toe spacers as part of our foot recovery that we do every single night and that we believe in so much at Naboso is just that foot reset. Okay. And then the last one would be working out. If you have bunions, I want you using your toe spacers when you do your balance exercises. I saw one of our master instructors, Roberto, who signed on and he teaches a lot of active aging barefoot balance classes. Anyone in that class who has a bunion 
in, I want them doing his barefoot balance workout with toe spacers on because it's important to how they actually try to engage their foot, right? If you're doing Pilates, if you're doing yoga, if you're doing any exercise, really, I want you using those toe spacers because the way that you push off and balance and um, squat and lift, right, is going to be dictated by your forefoot stability. Okay, so that's the way that you can start to think about the guidelines, the benefit, the why behind toe spacers and someone who has a bunion. Okay, I'm going to pause just for a moment to see if there's any questions specifically that relate around bunions, and then we're going to progress into the next condition. Okay. Great. So some people had said, what is MPJ? I do apologize. So your great toe joint, which is your first MPJ, is your first metatarsal phalangeal joint. So I do apologize. MPJ, that is the great toe joint. Okay, perfect. Thank you, Melanie, for, for answering and assisting me. Thank you, Evan, as well. Okay, now for short foot, um, if this is your first time kind of weaving into some of Naboso and EBFA's education, Short foot is an exercise in which you activate your foot. So there is going to be many extensions and links and courses that you can go from this webinar into understanding foot exercises and foot function. Short foot very quickly is the action of pushing your toes into the ground. When you push your toes into the ground, it activates the muscles in the bottom of the foot. The muscles in the bottom of your feet connect to your pelvic floor and they actually run all the way to your your tongue. So through EBFA, we teach you how to activate your toes while pushing your tongue to your pellet. And we consider that toe to tongue stability. It's how we maintain posture against gravity. So that's a little tease into what short foot is. Okay. Lots more, lots more. Okay. Uh, so Maria asked, do you need to buy wide shoes to wear toe spacers? and especially if you have a bunion. Now, the best type of shoe that works with toe spacers is going to be either a wide, wide shoe or a minimal shoe, which means that it has a wider toe box. So a wide shoe and a wide toe box are different. Okay, a wide toe box that many minimal shoes have is going to accommodate what's called splay or spread. So we want to splay. That's why it's called the Naboso splay, okay, is to open up and spread those digits and open up your metatarsal heads. So you would want to look more at like a zero shoe, a Vivo barefoot, a Lems, a New Balance Minimus, something like that. Okay. Um, uh, someone who's anonymous says any functional difference between the toe spacer that is located just between the first and the second, and then one that is in all digits. Um, obviously the one that is in all digits, like the splay is going to spread all of those digits versus just trying to pull that bunion over. I like the ones that are going to open up all of the digits so that we can create that full spreading and splaying. But that is a very good question because a lot of people with bunions are going to look oftentimes just at the first, between the first and the second. Okay. All right. So we're going to continue on. We will get to more questions. We're going to continue on to our second condition, which is hammer toes. This is one alongside with bunions that I'm sure you're like, oh, it's obvious, right? Why would I use toe spacers? Hammer toes is probably one of those that comes to mind. Of course, there's a lot more specificity to this than what is at face value, okay? So now if you have hammer toes, if your clients or your patients have hammer toes, did you know that there's actually different types of digit contractures, different types? Okay, not every hammer toe is the same or toe contracture is the same. So when we are approaching someone or ourselves with a toe contracture, we wanna understand what type do we even have? Okay, now most people will consider them hammer toes. A true hammer toe is when the first joint that is closest to the MPJ, right? Or the knuckle of the foot, Okay, the first joint of the toe, when that contracts, only that joint contracts, it is considered a 
hammer toe, a true hammer toe. Now, if you have the contracture just at the furthest joint, the joint that is the closest to the toenail, that is a mallet toe. Mallet toes are very common in those that have a Morton's toe. So a Morton's toe is when you have a long second digit. When your second digit is longer than the other digits, this Morton's toe, what often happens is that our shoes are fitted to the first, and then they're too small for the long second digit, and we essentially start to contract. So a mallet toe is most commonly seen in the second digit, but of course it can happen to others as well, but it's most common in the second. Okay, and then a claw toe would be if you get both the first joint and the second joint are contracting, that is going to be a claw toe. Okay, so we want to first differentiate, do we have a hammer, a mallet, or a claw? Okay, after that, right, you want to ask yourself or look at your own foot if you have hammer toes or contracted digits, okay, and say, is it flexible or rigid? Okay, can you go down to the toe? And if, uh, what I'm going to say for con simplicity is I'm just going to keep calling them hammer toes, even though please know that it's mallet, hammer, or claw. Okay, go down to your hammer toe. Digit contracture synonymous. Go down to the hammer toe and pull it straight. Okay, if you can pull it straight and then when you let go, it goes boom, back in. That is considered flexible. Does your toe have the capacity to still sit straight? Even if you have to pull it, but it can go straight, flexible, okay? If you take your hammer toe and you try to straighten, try to straighten, and, and it is stuck, then it is rigid. That means that that joint was inflamed. Inflammation creates stickiness, and you essentially have fused that joint in a contracted position. That is structural. It is rigid. It will not move. Okay. Between these two, flexible can be, in many cases, stretched and strengthened and corrected to eventually sit straight. Okay rigid are structural and can only become straight with surgery that's the biggest difference difference here okay now if someone has flexible they will benefit from toe spacers if someone has rigid they will still benefit from toe spacers for a slightly different reason Okay, now let's just go one step further because I want to go into a third type of classification or type, which is going to be what is causing this in the first place. Okay, is it related to an extensor dominance or a flexor dominance? Now, the way that you can differentiate this is going to be if you are standing in one place. Now, Short foot again is the exercise of pushing your toes down. So if we stand up, I'm gonna stand up and I'm gonna look at my toes and I'm gonna push them down. If you know how to do short foot, do short foot. I'm doing short foot, I'm looking at my toes. If I get these contractures, as soon as I do short foot or I push my toes into the ground, I have a flexor dominant hammer toe. Okay, that's the first way you can test it. Relax your feet, stand with your feet shoulder width apart, do a heel raise, a calf raise. I'm looking at my toes doing a calf raise. If they are contracted, I have flexor dominant hammer toes. Okay, that's the two ways that you can see them start to pop out. They're considered dynamic hammer toes. Okay, so you do short foot, you do a heel raise. If your digits are contracting and buckling in either of those tests or movements, it's a flexor dominance. Okay, let's go to the other one. Extensor dominance, stand up again. Okay, this time we're gonna do a squat. My chair is in the way, so I really can't squat, but let's everyone squat. You're gonna look down at your toes. If you look at your toes and they lift off of the ground, you got an extensor dominance hammer toe. Okay, relax the foot. The other way that you can see this is just march in place, pick up your feet, right? Marching, marching, marching. Every time you pick up your feet when you're marching, if those, those digits go boom, 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 right? And they lift kind of in this spastic way or a hypertonic way, every time you pick up your foot and march, you have an extensor dominant hammer toe, 
okay? Now, what that means, flexor dominance is going to be your long flexors, long flexors that come down, insert on the tips of the digits. Your long flexors are dominating the small intrinsic muscles of the foot. Extensor dominance, your extensors on the front of your shin, on the top of your foot that insert onto the distal or by the, the toenail of each digit. If it's dominant, it's going to pull that digit up. That's an extensor dominance, okay? Another way that this can start to present, I actually saw a patient this week with this, is the extensor dominance is going to pull that digit kind of up like this. And when an extensor dominance is so strong, it'll actually lift the digit on top of the foot. It'll sublux and lift that digit on top of the foot. That is a very dominant spastic extensor muscle that's pulling it up, okay? Extensor dominance, flexor dominance, okay? It's the way that we can start to differentiate it. Almost all hammer toes are muscle imbalance based, okay? Okay, so we got a few questions that we should be asking ourselves when we see hammer toes and toe contractures, okay? Is, is it a hammer? Is it a mallet? Is it a claw? Is it flexible? Is it rigid? Is it extensor dominant? Is it flexor dominant, okay? Meaning also, is it a dynamic hammer toe or is it also kind of structural? Dynamic hammer toes only show up when they're doing movement, like short foot, heel raises, step ups, things like that. Okay, so someone with hammer toes, I want you to use these in your shoes because again, a lot of hammer toes are dynamic, which means every single time you take a step, you are reinforcing that muscle imbalance that is creating that contracture. How do these guys help? Toe spacers help in hammer toes because they give it a mechanical advantage to the intrinsics, okay? The reason why I have someone with hammer toes wear toe spacers is not just to pull them straight and to stretch them. That's part of the reason. The main reason is that when you wear toe spacers in your shoes and you walk around, they're giving a mechanical advantage to the intrinsics. It's trying to balance out this muscle imbalance of either an extensor or a flexor dominance, okay? Which means also, I want you to wear them as much as possible, okay? Let's say you wear tight shoes or you cannot fit your toe spacers into your shoes. Then I want you wearing them at the end of the day as a form of recovery, just like we said with the bunions. Stretch it, splay it, open it up. You got to have a foot release routine when you get home at the end of the day. Okay. And then again, similarly, when working out. Now, the big uh, disclaimer on this is that if someone has flexible hammer toes, you could then say, can this actually start to reverse and balance out this flexible contracture? Yes, it can through consistent use. You can start to see straightening of the digits, balancing out of the digits. In someone that has rigid hammer toes, using toe spacers is never going to make these toes straight. Does that mean don't use toe spacers? No, because what is it doing? It's helping to spread them, splay them, stretch them, still create space. Because people with rigid hammer toes have a loss of balance. They start to get painful corns in between their toes because they're just compressed and contracted so tight. They start to get a lot of submet pain or metatarsalgia. So we want to be able to reverse a lot of that just constriction and contractures and tightness in their forefoot and to spread and splay and open them up, even if they stay contracted and rigid, because that's the way they're going to stay, you can start to still spread out those digits a little bit and create some balance. Okay. So that's the way that I want you to understand that flexible, rigid aspect, because some people may say, why am I using hammer toes if I have rigid hammer toes? Or why am I using toe spacers if I have rigid hammer toes? Or some people may tell someone inappropriately, using toe spacers is going to reverse your hammer toes. And that individual has 
rigid hammer toes. It is not, right? We need to make sure that we're very clear and transparent with these individuals, okay? Any questions? I'm gonna pause now to see if there's any questions that relate to hammer toes, okay? Let's see, let's see. Okay, here's a great one. So Stu said, I get cramps. So I get cramps that are happening in the digits. And this might not be your exact comment, Stu. So I do apologize, but I'm gonna kind of weave into what I do here a lot. Do you ever hear that some people will say at the end of the day, when I'm sleeping and relaxing to go to bed, my digits just start to like spasm and like a toe will lift and it's like the muscles contracting and it, it like won't let go. My mom says she always gets this, right? And then it's just like, okay. And you try to massage and release, right? To get that like toe spasm that happens at night. 100% using the toe spacers consistently is going to spread release, stretch, and open up that forefoot so those toe spasms start to decrease. So that's something great. I know, Stu, that was maybe not what you meant, <laughs> but you never know. Uh, Judith says that she gets uh, toe spasms when she does short foot exercises. Um, so that can be very similar as well. Make sure you're releasing, you're stretching, you're splaying, all of that when you are doing this, okay? Uh, let me see if there's anyone else. So, uh, Meg says, is there, is it best to wear toe spacers during activity only, or is it still helpful even when sitting? Great question, right? Working from home pandemic. Yeah. So you don't have to be moving to benefit from the toe spacers. You can be wearing these all day on your feet and you are sitting, just sitting, right? Sitting at your desk. Maybe you stand at your desk, maybe you're reading a book at the end of the day, you still could benefit from the stretch of all of those small digits, all the muscles. We'll talk about that shortly with our plantar fascia. So yes, there is still a benefit. So great, great question. Okay. Um, Sandy asks, can it help people in their 70s? Absolutely, absolutely, it can. Now the benefit to someone in their 70s, as we're pushing a little bit higher up, what starts to happen is that any imbalance that we have seen, let's say in our digits, starts to become a little bit more structural. So the tendency for someone who started as flexible hammer toes, as they get into their 60s, 70s, and plus, you're going to now start to see these imbalances become more rigid. So you would still, yes, even in a rigid hammer toe, even someone in their 70s, you really want to be using the toe spacers because you are stretching, you're opening up, you're creating space, you're improving balance. All of it is super, super important. Okay. Uh, I'm going to see if there is one more question, then we're going to continue on to our next topic. Uh, let's see. So Justin says, you mentioned metatarsalgia with hammer toes. How do toe spreaders influence or help metatarsalgia? So if you have never heard of metatarsalgia, what that means is just a fancy word that means pain in the ball of the foot, okay? It is as vague as saying low back pain, right? It's just kind of a catch-all of a symptom. It's not a diagnosis. Now, what metatarsalgia or pain in the ball of the foot comes from, especially as it relates to hammer toes, is going to be when your digits contract, it starts to create retrograde pressure. So the pressure from your body weight, right? And when you move, retrograde means it's going to come back behind and down onto those met heads, i.e. the ball of the foot. So people with hammer toes get ball of foot pain around the digit that is contracted. So if you have contractures in two, three, four, five, typically that patient will say, or that individual will say they have diffuse or the entire ball of their foot hurts, diffuse metatarsalgia. Okay. The cause of the metatarsalgia is the retrograde pressure from the hammer toes. So Justin, the way that toe spacers would minimize metatarsalgia is it straightening the digits, stretching and opening everything up, trying to balance out the muscle imbalance that created them in the first place to then minimize 
retrograde pressure to the ball of the foot. Okay. Hope that helps. All right. Let's continue on. More questions will be answered. Do not worry. Okay. Next up, we got neuromas. Okay. Now, a neuroma is a ball of scarred nerve tissue that is found in the ball of the foot, typically between metatarsal three and four, although it can be in between all of your metatarsals. So it's not just between three and four. The one between toes three and four is classically a Morton's neuroma. Okay. When it's in between those digits, that's what it's called. When it's between any other digits, it's a neuroma. Okay. Now, typically what happens is that someone will complain about a sharp pain in the ball of the foot when they roll forward to take a step. They may feel like there's a pee or a wrinkle or a pebble or something in their sock and they take the shoe out, they take the sock off, nothing's there, put it back in and they're just like, oh, it's so weird. Like there's something that I'm stepping on, right? Um, you may get tingling and numbness into the digits. It is classically on the inside of the digit. Okay, and that just has to do with the way that your digit nerves run and innervate the toes. Okay, now what causes a neuroma is going to be compression of the forefoot. Now, are you compressing the forefoot because you're wearing tight shoes? Quite possibly, right? Are you compressing your forefoot because you have a big old bunion, right? That could be. Okay. Are you compressing it because you didn't stabilize the foot sufficiently as you pushed off? Now, this is actually where I see a lot of neuromas. What needs to happen when we walk and we roll into what's called a lever position. So if everyone does a calf raise with me, just look at your foot seated or standing and do a calf raise. Look at your foot in that position. That is called a rigid lever. It's a lever position of the human foot. Now, as you roll forward into a lever, what has to happen in the back of your foot, kind of demonstrate this here, everything has to pull up like this. All of your fascia, your anatomy, your tendons, your nerves, they have to pull up towards your heel, okay? If you do not sufficiently or rapidly stabilize the foot as you roll into a lever, you don't pull that tissue up fast enough and you roll and you pinch on these neuromas. Okay. So it's really a stability issue. A lot of people are just going to blame tight shoes, tight shoes. That's what it is. You're just squeezing the foot. I obviously said that as well, but it's not the true cause. It's that there's insufficient stability or stiffening uh, retro pull back of the tissue. That's what it is. Okay. So what we need to do is make sure that we are providing sufficient stability, spreading, splaying, opening up, and activation of the intrinsic muscles and the fascia in the bottom of the foot. This is why I'm such a huge advocate of our insoles and our socks and barefoot and minimal shoes is because you have to keep feet intrinsically strong, and it is part of a neuroma, okay? So if you have a neuroma, I do recommend toe spacers. The reason is that I want to open up, spread, and splay, right, the foot itself to try to trigger a more stable foot. Obviously, depending on the foot, we might to need to use some other things. In certain cases, you do need orthotics. That's kind of another conversation. Um, but we want to kind of spread and open up for that neuroma. When you spread your digits like this and you open it up, you support lymphatic and a microvascular circulation, which is part of a detox perspective, a recovery perspective, right? If you have um, inflammation and goop down the garbage, right? We got to flush it out through circulation. That's what your circulatory system and your lymphatic system does. It's part of the display, okay? Um, also in conjunction, you can start to support and take tension off of those met heads. Um, Really, I would use toe spacers and a metatarsal pad in combination, that, that combination for that, okay? So wider shoes, toe spacers, and a met pad. That would be my 
stack or my trifecta for someone with a neuroma. Use it in your shoes as much as throughout the day as a form of recovery or when working out. So it's going to be the same as the other ones. You'll see a trend. Okay, now little pause here again to see if there are any questions. I'm just gonna take real briefly these just for the sake of time. Okay, uh, let me see if there's any questions related to here. Uh, Rochelle says, when I look up splay, lots of articles come up as if it is a deformity and not a good thing. I thought wide splay was a goal to strive for. So that is correct. Um, so that is actually a very good question. Uh, I'm not sure what you're looking at. You can totally inbox me to make sure. Now, when you hear the word splay, there is toe splay and there's metatarsal splay. Metatarsal splay is the spreading of each metatarsal away from each other. Now, when they pull away from each other, they trigger the nerves in the fascia to stabilize in the foot. So met splay and toe splay are how we create a stable foundation. It's how we increase skin to surface contact. It's how you maintain balance. It's how you release energy. So splay equals good. Now, does splay make your foot wider? Yeah. So if you start to do a lot of splay and barefoot and toe spacers and you can't fit into your Manolos anymore, then maybe you consider splay a bad thing, but I don't know, right? Maybe don't buy those thousand dollar shoes and <laughs> put it towards more Vivos or something, but splay is definitely a benefit, a positive, okay? One last question, though, we're moving on. Rachel says, can you wear toe spacers during sleep? Is it the same effect? Now, you can wear them when you sleep. Um, at Naboso, we say to not, but I have to think as a company from a liability perspective, let's say you wear these toe so long and you, for some random reason, cut off circulation, and now that's a liability that you lost circulation to a toe. I don't want that on my on my time, right? So we say to not wear toe spacers at night when you're sleeping. We uh, recommend it any other time. Does not mean that if you wear them when you sleep on your own discretion, it's a bad thing. It's your own discretion, okay? Uh, she's saying, uh, you mentioned 70s. Can they be used in elderly as high as 100 years old? Absolutely. You could use it for 120 years old if you want. Uh, they might have a hard time getting them on, so they might need some assistance. That's the only thing. Okay. All right. So we're continuing on your plantar fascia. That is going to be the last condition that we go into. And then I got a couple research articles for you. Uh, and then we got some other real quick pearls. So we are just continuing on. Thank you guys for being part of this webinar. Just a few more minutes as we push through. And then I do want to talk about the brand new splay that we're launching. Uh, most likely Memorial Weekend, just a few delays at the factory because of our friendly COVID. Of course, that has to be in the way of most things. <laughs> okay. So let's continue on to plantar fasciitis. So how do toe spacers, how does something at your digit benefit tissue that originates at your heel? How is that possible, right? Look at the origin of the plantar fascia, but look at where it inserts. So it's inserting on the base of your digits, right? So when someone starts to get stress and strain to their plantar fascia, oftentimes it's because of a lack of elasticity and stiffness within the tissue. So you start to get micro injury. So part of what we like to maintain through a healthy plantar fascial tissue is that we're not just thinking of how our plantar fascia blends into our Achilles tendon, but we wanna think about how our plantar fascia inserts into the base of our digits. Now, if you look at this cadaver image here, you can see your plantar fascia coming across the arch, thick band of tissue, and then it's splitting into five slips. And each of those slips or pieces of tendon or ligaments or your plantar fascia is called a plantar plate, and it inserts into the base of the toe. So by wearing toe spacers and opening up those digits and stretching them, you are inherently starting to stretch your plantar fascia. But there's more. 
because your plantar fascia, as it comes into the digit as a plantar plate, it goes horizontal and it becomes what's called a deep transverse metatarsal ligament. Next page here, look at this. Look at this beautiful tissue. Met head, met head, met head, connecting each of these met heads to each other is this ligament, which is your plantar fascia, which blends into your plantar plates, which inserts into the base of the toes. So all of that anatomy around your MPJs is plantar fascia. So when you use toe spacers and you stretch and you splay and you open up and you support four foot alignment, you are opening up supporting that plantar fascia all the way back to your heel. This is very important to your lever, lever position. Okay. You want to have a strong, stable, balanced lever. And part of that is going to be linked to your plantar fascia. Okay, so to maintain healthy plantar fascia, if someone does have active plantar fasciitis, in addition to everything else that I recommend for plantar fasciitis, including releasing with the neural ball, using our insoles, etc., is going to be using toe spacers. Okay, so you could justify your recommendation of toe spacers for plantar fascial issues by saying your plantar fascia blends into the digits, becomes a ligament. So stretching and splaying is actually stretching your plantar fascia, okay? That would be your recommendation as why, or your justification as why you are recommending toe spacers for someone with plantar fasciitis. And then your recommendations are gonna be the same in your shoes as much as possible as a form of recovery and when working out, okay? We want to make sure that we are balancing this out as much as we can, throughout the day, because that's when you're stressing your fascia, right? It's the one thing that I've learned as a podiatrist, especially a podiatrist practicing in Manhattan, is that it is the day-to-day -day stress of just walking around, walking to work, walking our dog, running errands or whatever it is that is placing so much stress on our feet. It's not the workout in the gym. It is this small micro stress that accumulates day, 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 day. That is where we're actually starting to break down. Okay. So that's why I'm such an advocate of using the toe spacers during the day in your shoes. Okay. If your shoes can accommodate. All right. So what I'm going to do for the sake of time is I'm going to go through the rest of the slides and then go into answering some of your questions. Now, many of you have awesome, awesome questions. So if for some reason we do not get to all of the questions, I'm typing in my email and let me, I'm going to, I was going to give you a different email, but I'm actually going to give you my real email. Not that I wasn't going to give you my real email. I was going to give you just a general info at Naboso, but I'm going to give you dremily at Naboso.com. So dremily Naboso.com. That is going to be the email. If you have a question and we do not get to it. Okay. So we are going to continue onto our, whoops, onto our next slide. So if you are looking at the benefits of toe spacers beyond hammer toes, bunions, neuromas, plantar fascia, right? Is there more benefit? Of course there is. Okay. So these are a few research studies to start exploring where we could start to see these additional benefits. So this is a research study, 2018. The effects of toe spacers, spreaders, toe spacer spreaders, call them what you want, right? Put splay, nebosa splay, right? The effect of toe spacers on plantar pressure, plantar pressure and gait in chronic stroke patients. Okay. Now what happens in people who start to get various neurological injury and disorders, neuropathies, stroke, MS, Parkinson's, et cetera, spinal cord lesions, uh, all of that is that you will start to see that they get what is called a neurological foot. Okay. A neurological foot is that your foot starts to get pulled in like this. Okay. This is a high arch. And I've had many patients, various neurological conditions come in and they're saying, ever since this one foot, right, since my diagnosis, the last five years or a few years, I'm noticing my foot becoming more like this, okay? 
what is happening is that you lose this muscle imbalance between the anterior and the posterior, the, the extensors and flexors, the intrinsic start to become really weak and everything gets pulled in like this. So the arches lifting is becoming more and more rigid. You lose ankle mobility and your digits, boom, start to lift up. Okay, classic neurological foot. So you're going to see it in strokes. As your digits come up, now the digits contracting, retrograde pressure. That was my, my answer to Justin, right? So Justin, we were talking about metatarsalgia. So people with strokes and that hammering are going to have a lot of metatarsalgia, hot spot plantar pressure. So here it's saying the feet make the initial contact with the ground when walking and critically control both posture and gait. Hammer toe, claw toe contractures is a structural change that the foot develops after a stroke or neurological injury. Put anything else in there. Triggering functional change affecting both the lower legs and balance. Now, what they did is they used the toe spacers as an intervention for this, this study. And they saw that all gait variables significantly improved when the toe spacers were used. So their conclusion was that toe spacers may improve overall gait and spatial temporal gait parameters and chronic stroke, okay? All right, so now you could say, instead of just thinking of locally hammer toes, I wanna to straighten the digits, go big picture, go function, okay? I need to maintain functional movement in my client. My client has a neurological condition or had a stroke. I don't want them to fall. Here's a research study showing that using toe spacers can improve balance and stabilization in someone so they can walk better and not hurt themselves, right? So we're taking something that is very like, it's hammer toes, right? Man, they're ugly, yeah, right? No, no, we're talking about someone not falling, someone being able to move, feel more stable. They have more movement confidence because we're helping them actually contact the ground with their digits, right? Add in an aboso insult with that and boom, right? We are really helping to reduce falls. So if you work with anyone who is baby boomer, um, neuro rehab, medical fitness, any of that, neuropathy patients, here now you could say this is a balance tool, right? I love it. I love it. Okay. All right. Here's another one balance, right? It's just another study to validate the other one. Okay. Immediate effect of toe spacers on balance and subacute or chronic strokes, right? Stroke happened to be researched more so because of that uh, kind of neurological foot that is a result. Their conclusion here is that the conclusion drawn from the study is that toe spacers have a significant effect on improving balance in stroke. Great. Okay, 87% reduction time in getting up. That's awesome. 87%. That's huge right? And then showed an enhancement on a Berg balance test. Okay. Another validation. Love it. Okay. Here's another one by Lee. It might be the same Lee um, as the first study that I showed. Immediate effect of using toe spacers on the tibialis anterior and the peroneus longus muscles, right? Can we balance the way that these extrinsic muscles are controlling the foot? For those that know anatomy well, your tibialis anterior and your peroneus longus control your first ray of your foot, which controls your big toe joint, okay? So it's essentially saying, if you use toe spacers, does it balance out the stabilization of your first ray to become a lever in a better way? And this study was saying, yes, yes, it does, right? It balances out the muscle activation of the extrinsics to create more medial lateral support during walking, right? Which I take that support, the greatest demand on the tibial stand here and the peroneus longus during gait is when it is in a lever, calf raised position, right? We do that position when we push off to take a step. If I can make a lever more stable in the ankle and the forefoot by using toe spacers, I'm sold. It's 20 bucks and you're helping someone get a more stable lever position. Huge, huge, right? Okay, let's get into some success tips here for Naboso. Okay, Naboso splay, not Naboso in general, just Naboso splay. So you can obviously see these pictures here. There were some pictures throughout that were showing the brand new splay. So this is our current splay 
to the cameras. This is our current spray. Many, many of you have them. Uh, great feedback on them. They're very comfortable. They're soft material. They hook around the digits, which keeps them more stable on the foot. Uh, I also really like the hooking around the toes for people who have short toes. Uh, some other brands that don't hook around the toes. A lot of my patients with shorter toes kept saying they fall off. Um, the softer material is to create more comfort for those. Now, compared to here, the new splay that is launching end of May, where we just spoke to my husband about kicking it off Memorial Weekend, so stay tuned for that, is that you can see it is slightly different from a a uh, coloring perspective. There's a little bit of texture on it just to create some ooh -la, la on it. Okay, the Nubosa logo is obviously engraved on there or embossed on it. And the best part is that it is a high quality material. So if your current splay, you've noticed that it gets a little bit fragile, maybe a little bit of slipping or potential tearing in those, right? It's just that level of material that it is. So new one, very high quality material, still soft and comfortable, easier to clean. That is awesome. And then we just increase the height of the, the part that hooks around the big toe. So that part right here on this gentleman's toe, that's just become a little bit bigger compared to this one. So you can kind of see that difference. And that's just to become more comfortable, especially for our male uh, customers that are using those. Okay, you got those, here we go. So if you are new to Naboso Splay and toe spacers in general, we recommend using them for 30 minutes a day. Gradually increase the time that you're using them. For some people, it drives them bananas after a few minutes wearing them, right? So start at 30 minutes, slowly increase. When you start to adapt to them, then you can right start to increase that time. If you wear them for a couple hours in your shoes and you just feel like, ah, I just need to take it off, no problem. Take it off, put it on again at the end of the day, no problem. You build up your tolerance kind of like minimal shoes. It's progressive, okay? Clean them frequently, of course, because they're on your feet, your bare skin, you're gonna get sweat. If you sweat a lot, especially in between these interspaces, you can get fungus. We do not want fungus around here. All of these, just as an FYI, are latex-free. They are non-toxic. So them on your skin and you sweating, they're BPA-free, latex-free, healthy, healthy. We do not want anything uh, dangerous to anyone. Make sure you are positioning them correctly. So I just did an Instagram video on this. And when you look at these, so when you're putting this on your foot, you want to make sure that the curved part, the smooth part is actually facing down. So this is how I would put it on my foot like this. Now you will see some videos on Instagram, social media, internet that says, put them like this on your foot. But if you look at that, look at the curve, right? So you would be putting it on your foot and then kind of doing that. Do you see how I'm bending it weird? No, no, no. Smooth part goes down because of the natural curve. This curve of the toe spacer is matching what is called the parabola of the foot. Your met heads create a curve just like my arrow is doing. And that's what the toe spacers are following. Okay, so I just want you to understand that perspective. All right, so what we're gonna do is see if there are any questions, but before we take those questions, we have our promotion. Okay, so write down this discount code, BOGO50 through Sunday night, will get you buy one, get one 50% off. Okay, so buy one, get one 50% on those toe spacers, Naboso Splay. Go to naboso.com. Naboso.com. This is around the world. Enter BOGO50. You will get one splay. Buy one splay, get another splay 50% off. There is no limit. So if you buy two splay, you get two splay 50% off, which is awesome. Okay. So make sure you stock up on those. All right. So I am going to answer any questions for the next three minutes, and then we will wrap up just to respect everyone's time. Awesome. Okay. Uh, Terry said Freet is another good brand of wide toe box shoes. 
Spreet. I had actually not heard of that one. So thank you, Terry. Uh, MP suggests Ultra, another great brand. Thank you very much for those suggestions. Um, Zero Shoes, love those. Great. Thank you so much. Um, Judith says she uses toe spacers with yoga. Absolutely 100%. 100 percent that is great can splay be worn on top of five finger socks such as in gingy yes 100 percent. so please do know you could wear them over toes separated socks like in gingy or any of the other brands that might be out there awesome awesome uh, yes, Anya's review. So Anya's, Anya's reviews.com. She's actually a reseller of Naboso. So we love Anya. Um, she reviews all of the different wide toe box shoes that are out there. This is in all countries. So some of them are very specific to Europe. Europe actually has a lot of minimal shoe brands that are out there. So go to Anya's reviews.com. Check her out also on Instagram. Her reviews are great. Um, and as I had said, she's also a reseller of Naboso. So check those out. Um, let me see if anyone else. Um, do, do, do. Yes, so applicable to CMT, Charcot Marie tooth patients, 100% Paul. So yeah, CMT, which is a uh, sensory and motor neuropathy, 100% um, CMT classically gets digit contracture. So yes, you would want to use it in CMT or Charcot Marie tooth. Okay. Um, Carol asks about the metatarsal pad. Um, this is what a metatarsal pad is. I actually have it on the base of a of an insole I was showing a patient. So this is a metatarsal pad. You would place it on the foot like that. So do you see how I'm not on the ball of the foot? I'm just short of the ball of the foot. That's where you place the met pad when you have a neuroma. So toe spacers, met pad, just short of the ball of the foot. That's what you would do for a neuroma. Okay. Excellent. Great, great, great. Uh, let me see if there's anyone else. Can you wear spacers during sleep? Answer that already. For flexible dominant hammer toes, would you recommend the straps in addition to toe spacers? Um, the straps in addition to the toe spacers. Um, not necessarily. Uh, you could tape the digits down, but that would actually be more of a um, extensor dominant that you would want to do that. Okay. Um, here we go. Last question I'm going to answer. And then anyone who has any additional questions, I'm going to give my email one last time. So everybody has that Dr. Emily at Naboso.com. Last question was a great one from Ruth, Ruth in Florida. How are you? Um, she asks, is it normal for someone to have all of the hammer toes except the big toe? So is it common to see two, three, four, five? Or is it more common to see one, two, three, four, five? Okay. Question or the answer is that it is actually more common to see two, three, four, five because of the extensor digitorum longus is different than your extensor hallucis longus. Okay. Now, if you happen to see a contracted hallux or big toe that is called a hammered hallux, and that is much more rare than the other hammer toes, that typically is a spasticity component to it, much harder to address that with toe spacers, that I would definitely say probably book the consultation, because it's a little bit more complex mechanically than other hammer toes, but two, three, four, five, very common to have all of them, five and four are the most common because of footwear, all of them can benefit from the toe spacers. Okay. Thank you all so much. Again, everyone's going to get the recording. Do not forget BOGO 50, buy one, get another one 50% off. That is valid through the end of day Sunday. Stay tuned for your new splay that are launching Memorial Weekend. Thank you guys all so, so much. I hope you enjoyed the topic. I absolutely love toe spacers and I hope that you do as well. Thank you guys so much.